great to have you back. Thanks for having me on. Hey Jim, let's let's get right down to it since I know time is limited for you. It's been a while since we last spoke and a lot has changed since that time. Uh, it's tough to actually find a starting point, but I suppose the election might be a good enough place to start. Care to share your thoughts on which path we'll follow depending on who gets elected? What about the damaging emails released by WikiLeaks and so on? Can you make your comments on that for us, Jim? Well, I think that um, if the American electorate has any common sense at all, they'll look very closely at what uh, has come out in WikiLeaks. Uh, they very clearly show the deeply ingrained corruption within uh, the Clinton family, the Clinton campaign, and the Clinton foundation. It's uh, very dangerous to, to think that uh, Hillary Clinton might be our next president. Any differences about Trump should it be? I personally do not think the, the uh, party is going to let him step into play there, but should he? Do you see any different path developing? Well, um, I, I have to agree that um, Trump is so much of an outsider that um, there's a very high likelihood that something could be staged uh, to prevent his being seated in office. And in terms of what, how the world might look in a, with a Trump administration versus a Clinton administration, I think that we're still in a very dangerous world. There are manifold threats and people need to be prepared regardless. I feel um, much in agreement with what you're saying. However, the thing is, I, I, I'm still of the opinion through my research, it really at this point, it's kind of, it doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a pony, it's still a show. Like, a, they're, you know, they're just, they're just on the end of the string. Some, but some hand is above them somewhere, both on either side. I think you're right. Um, I think that Hillary is more beholden to... Um, perhaps George Soros and more beholden to international banking interests, but um, Trump himself also is beholden to a lot of corporate interests. And I don't think we're going to see too much change in uh, the way our government does business, the scale of government, the level of regulation, and um, just life in general. I don't think it's going to be that much different whether we end up with a Republican or a Democrat in office. It's long been said there's not a nickel's worth of difference between the two parties. Jim, uh, about three, three and a half years ago, I took a lot of flack on a comment made in several posts about don't be surprised of a third party development or a martial law should something not work out. How are you thinking about that lately? Well, um, I think in the long term, there's, there's going to be room for the growth of uh, third parties. In the short term, I don't think anyone like Gary Johnson is, is really going to have much of a chance at all. Uh, long term, though, I think there there could be really room for a third party, especially if we continue to see a high level of corruption and uh, nepotism uh, in both Republican and the Democrat parties. It, it, it is only going to serve to further disgust the American voters. Do you feel the uh, martial law cards are swept off the table, or seriously, if, if there is, because in the alternative media, uh, it, it's looking strong on the Trump side with actual votes. Now, I don't particularly believe that's going to come to play. I do believe, though, they might call a delay of some sort. It's possible. Um, in fact, in a conversation earlier today with Alex Jones, we were talking about the possibility of a cyber attack that could... Uh, postpone the election or postpone suiting a, seating a president or possibly even suspending the election altogether. Whether it's martial law, whether it's the advent of World War III, whether it's uh, a socioeconomic collapse, there's any number of different things that could happen that could cause either a, a delay or a complete suspension of the election. There's a far more important election that transpires on December 4th. An entire continent undoubtedly is going to shift directions, entering into completely new territories. No question its effects are going to be felt worldwide. Comment on why it's not even being found in Western media. And of course, I'm talking about the Italian referendum. Mm -hmm. Well, um, because of the weak uh, conditions of the entire southern tier, 
of the European Union. The Italian referendum is going to be quite important. And uh, also the, uh, the next South African election is also going to be quite important. In, in global affairs, I think. Regardless of what happens in Italy, though, I don't think we're going to see any, uh, you know, astounding news of great stability in the southern tier of the EU. We're going to continue to see uh, a lot of financial turmoil. Uh, there'll probably be more uh, bank bail-ins. There'll be a further erosion of banking privacy in Italy, Spain, Greece. It's bound to happen. What do you feel, though, uh, in terms, my thoughts about the EU in general was a 28-country uh, test, really, <laughs> a, lab, uh, a lab result. Uh, you know, it supported a bastardized currency called the euro, which is bound to fail over time. And most people don't grasp there's a huge difference between two people from different states, let's say Louisiana and Texas, versus two people from completely different countries. Yeah, it's a long way from Norway to Naples. Yeah, and they share nothing in common. I mean, their history, their culture, their language. Uh, America right. shares these commonalities. It's just a matter of time. And we could see uh, a dissolution of the EU into maybe three blocks initially and then a complete dissolution. But I have to agree with you, in the long term, the EU is is doomed to failure, just cannot work. Jim, what are you seeing over about the line in the sand recently drawn in Syria? Talk to me about both sides here. Well, I think that the, that the U.S. has made a huge mistake in announcing their plans for a no-fly zone for northern Syria. And it could very well push us toward a third world war. Up till now, what's going on in Syria has largely been a, a function of nation states supporting various surrogates inside of Syria with different proxy armies. If we institute a no-fly zone, that would put us, have the potential for putting us in direct confrontation with Russia. And if we start shooting down Russian planes, it's not that far uh, for World War III to break out. Why is it so much of the Western population is not understanding the U.S. and Russia are already at war? They're just holding the events. They're staging them in different countries. Well, yeah, in effect, uh, we've been in a, a Cold War for many, many years, of course, even uh, under the Soviet Union. But even after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Cold War really continued. And then things accelerated with the Ukraine crisis starting four years ago. That's never been resolved. And in fact, last year, the U.S. Congress voted for lethal aid to go to the Ukraine. That was a very provocatory, uh, provocative uh, step. And I don't think most people in the United States even heard the news that that happened. And then, of course, since then, uh, things have been spinning out of control in Syria. And uh, we're already in a war of words, a lot of saber rattling and an economic war, and to a lesser extent, a cyber war. But it could come down to an out and out shooting war in a very short period of time if things don't uh, come back into control. I want to shift a little bit geographically. Jim, there's an almost unbreakable bond between Russia and China. And it's a bond that most are not even aware of exists. It's not energy and it's not silk roads. The bond I'm talking about is potable water. Russia has over 25% of the world's potable water and China is basically transforming into a desert. Uh, they use Lake uh, Baikal. It's currently supplying China with vast amounts of its potable water and can continue to do so for several decades. Comment on why no one mentions this when referring to the strong bond between both countries, aside from geographic bond. Well, yes, um, it, is, it is true that they've, they've had a strong bond. It dates back to the days of communist China and Soviet Russia. And the, but economically, those ties are still in place. And the Trans-Siberian Railroad infrastructure, uh, in effect, uh, is a a great attribute to both Russia and China. Most people don't realize how much uh, trade ends up going out of uh, Siberia and in, 
off of Kamchatka into the Pacific markets. There's also a lot of cooperation that's gone on for many, many years between the Soviets uh, and later the, the Russians with the Chinese in terms of military developments, in terms of tank technology, artillery technology, radar technology, missile technology, that has not been very well publicized in the West. That uh, co-development is still going on. It's every bit as strong as the co-development that went on between, uh, say, South Africa and Israel uh, 20 years ago. There's also a bridge that recently started construction. I did a, uh, I launched recently a second site, a little bit more serious of a site called Something Feels Wrong, and I recently put out a post in it, and I, I have it on there. I'm not going to look it up now, though, but it's a, it's a four-lane highway that takes a day-and-a-half connection and reduces it to under 20 minutes. And where is this? Between China and Russia. Wow. Direct connection. Yes, isn't, I know that's substantial, but yet nobody's talking about it. Interesting. Well, um, I think that the more that people can uh, tune in to global economics and take a closer look at some of the deep ties that exist between countries, that will help them to formulate their perception of where things might fall out in terms of if there is a World War III, who the players will be and how they will align themselves. And I don't think that uh, Russia and China are going to end up on opposite sides in the next world war. They're very likely to be on the same side. Uh, the other interesting dynamic is China and India. And that's something that's also very uh, poorly pu publicized in the West. But it, the Indian uh, Navy, for example, is... Um, in co-development with submarines with China. I know. Well, I, I mean, ge geographically, this makes about as much sense as saying America can't trade with Canada. Sure. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? It's it's just geographically, you border each other. There's no way of stopping this. And share with me if you agree my way of thinking from outside looking in. I feel the most dangerous thing as human beings, regardless of our differences, we're currently facing right now is a toxic foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you there as well, Barry. Um, right now, most of the national governments are working contrary to the best interests of their citizenry. Because if you look at the way foreign trade is handled and um, the, the forex market in currencies and the international credit markets, as well as Bank of International Settlements, for example, all of that is geared toward assisting corporate interests and international banking interests rather than assisting in the development of nation states and bettering the, the livelihood of day-to-day -day citizens around the world, whether they're first, second, or third world countries. Jim, survival is definitely one thing, and, and we both look at it from different angles. Um, since I last spoke to you, though, I can honestly say the oil and the transmission is no hotter. So uh, as long as we keep getting rain uh, and we just got a load of it from that storm, uh, things, things tend to work out quite good here. But um, I want to touch one more thing. Would you agree with me like you did just prior? The second most dangerous thing we all face right now is an ignorant population? Oh, certainly. Yes. Um, people need to wake up to the realities of the, the modern milieu. They need to recognize propaganda for what it is. They need to recognize that so-called independent media in, in our country and elsewhere is actually state-controlled media and that it's incumbent upon individuals to educate themselves and to filter out the nonsense because unfortunately the nonsense is the prevailing the prevailing view that's being pumped into our brains by, by television and the internet through the corporate controlled media. We're doing our best, but how do you do this? People are afraid to get out of their comfort zone. Even the so-called informed, they want to be part of the group. They don't want to be the outsider. They don't want to be in someone's face saying, you need to understand this. How do we do it? Well, I think it's just a matter of 
um, waking people up, alerting people to the presence of the alternative media. A lot of people don't even go beyond the mainstream media plus perhaps, say, the Drudge Report or, say, World Net Daily. And those are still... Um, the widely read news services, and they do they do key into other alter, alternative media. But if you'll notice, most of the links that end up on the Drudge Report end up right back to the mainstream media. So uh, they're like insider outsiders. So it's important that uh, people wake up, uh, alert their friends to all the alternative media that exists. And uh, again, you need to be perceptive and, and filter out the nonsense because there's, there's a lot of mediocrity out there and there's a lot of just plain lies out there, a lot of gray, gray and black propaganda that exists and people need to be very discerning. There's a lot of al uh, alternative websites out there that don't seem to have any, any discernment at all and they just throw everything together. You have sites like beforeitsnews.com that throws in legit, throws legitimate news into the mix along with, you know, gray aliens ate my baby kind of stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there, there, we certainly need to have a higher level of discernment, and I think it may come down to the development of a alternative to, to the Internet as we know it. Because not only is the Internet falling under the control of the United Nations, but all of the, the web search engines seem to be now in cahoots with the mainstream media, pointing everyone back to the mainstream media. So if you type in, you go to Google.com and type in a search, search on Hillary Clinton health or Trump corporate interests, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get for responses from that search because the searches are now all skewed. And people need to be aware that they're being lied to in some very uh, subtle and sophisticated ways. Yes, these people do know where words originate from, and they definitely use that to their advantage. Um, I'd like to shift briefly while we still have a bit of time back into the States and uh, travel back with me just a few decades, Jim. Over 90% of what's considered important, the United States finished first or a very close second. Subjects such as happiness, education, quality of life, rate of infant mortality, all of these America finished first or, like I say, very close second. Right. Uh, while just doing a bit of research uh, recently, I can't find anything there in the top ten. I mean, they're right now approximately 5% of the population representing, yet consuming close to 70% of the world's antidepressants. The same 5% is making up for over 25% of the world's incarcerated. What's going on? They're not, the, the closest thing I can find is 12th place here, and that's in happiness. Now, I realize that's subjective. I realize that's subjective. What's happy for one is not for another. But talk with me. I, I mean, I haven't lived there in four decades. What the heck is going on? Well, things are definitely in decline in the United States. I think a lot of it has to do with the scale of government that we've taken on. Uh, we've basically, uh, especially after 9-11, tacitly agreed to a larger scale of government, greater government intrusiveness in our lives, government scrutiny of every aspect of our lives. We're essentially living now in a surveillance state in the United States. Most Americans don't even realize it or they'd like to forget about it. They don't want they they have turned themselves into intelligence gathering voters essentially for the entire uh, police state and now they're doing it by way of their their cell phones which are active even when people don't think they're active whenever they have a battery in them they are tracking their users the nsa is now effectively listening to every conversation they're all being keyword searched not just international calls but all domestic calls people have cameras built into their laptops, their iPads, their iPhones, even their computer monitors on their desks are constantly filming every American. There are, of course, also countless CCTVs all over, especially in urban areas, that are monitoring every aspect of our lives. And within a few years, that entire network of cameras is going to be key into facial recognition and into license plate scanning. So privacy is just about gone in the United States. Most Americans don't realize it. 
And we've signed up to this whole level of government, this whole surveillance state, higher taxation, more regulation. Uh, it's, it's so incredibly intrusive that it's almost inescapable. Well, don't they, say, don't they say you get the government you deserve? Unfortunately, yes, they do, and it's true. And, and what happened after 9-11 was people gave up their freedom in exchange for security. That's the bottom line. Well, that's at that point, roughly after 9-11, is when they stopped taking their citizens as fools and started taking them as cowards. Yes. You see, that that's the point they knew they weren't going to do anything anymore. That's why they don't hide these stage events, these false shootings, these school shootings. They're so blatantly set up. A fool could see that, but they no longer care. If they wanted to make it secretive, I mean, it would be easy for them. They got the resources to do it. But they, they realize now the citizens are divided, they're conquered, and, and, and they're cowards, basically. They're not standing up. Right. Honestly, in today's day and age, if your vote really mattered, do you really think you'd be allowed to do so? <laughs> now, I haven't completely given up on the electoral process, but essentially, when we're handed candidates who are all hand-selected by the powers that be, and you have your option of pro-big government status candidate A versus pro-big government status candidate B, what real choice do you have? Well, really, in a country with 330 million people, if that's the best two you can come up with, you're in serious yoga. <laughs> You won't have any argument with me on that one, Barry. I, I, it does make expatriation look a lot more desirable to people like me. And it, with the prospect of either Hillary or Trump clamping down on freedom of speech, I think a lot of bloggers will very soon have to make a very tough decision about whether they need to expatriate in order to be able to continue to speak freely. Well, with our last uh, conversation, remember I was discussing that as one of the three imperative parts of any Plan B. Without an escape route, uh, you're, you're a stool with two legs and, and you're going to topple. You, I mean, just check history. You don't have to even accept my, my philosophy about it. Just check history and you'll see that's proven correct. Yes. I, I do recommend that all of my readers, I've mentioned it several times in my blog, at the very minimum, keep their passports updated. And uh, I've also been talking about hedging into foreign currencies quite a bit recently. I was buying Swiss francs when they cost 77 cents a piece. It now takes a dollar and three cents to buy a Swiss franc. A uh, real bargain uh, in the next few months is going to be the Great Britain, Great Britain pound which is going to be approaching parity with the U.S. dollar. Well, even now, you know, Jim, you, you can't fall off the floor, right? I mean, uh, the pound uh, is an excellent investment even now. As a matter of fact, since Brexit, who's the strongest economy in Europe right now? It's Britain. Right. Who's, who's got the lowest unemployment right now? you got to go to Britain. Right. Who is working their butt off because everybody wants to buy when there's blood in the water? They're getting orders for exports like crazy right. because of that. People in Western cultures need to really start grasping that the strong dollar is going to be their demise. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> right now, um, British textile makers, British uh, car makers, for example, can't even keep up with orders because, in part, because of the weak weak pound. But I think that in the long term, the pound is going to appreciate versus the dollar and 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 versus gold. I agree with you on that statement for sure. The uh, the other thing is though, I don't know how many uh, Westerners, by their nature of of how they've been taught to save and invest. Uh, of course, nothing's ever black or white, but various shades of gray. However, with a mere point zero three. That's point zero three of Americans owning a foreign bank account. I think you're trying to teach a dog a card trick on that one. <laughs> yeah, um, it is wise for uh, Americans to expatriate some of their funds, even in it, their physical expatriation is only a remote possibility. It's just common sense to hold at least part of your assets offshore in a foreign currency 
or precious metals on safe deposit in a foreign country. Well, absolutely. I mean, spreading one's portfolio uh, is, is, you know, and that, that, the, these type of uh, questions will uh, warrant maybe, a, 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 you know, another interview in the future. I, I wanted to close off with something and then hear your thoughts on it. This is a recent article from uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, Paul Craig Roberts. It's titled Post Armageddon, and uh, I'm quoting him. Americans need to wake up to the dangerous situation that Washington has created, but I doubt they will. Most wars will happen without the public's knowledge until they happen. I and a few others try to alert people to the real threats that they face, but our voices are not loud enough. Not even Vladimir Putin's voice is loud enough. It looks like the West won't hear until there remains nothing at all of German and NATO troops and of Poland and Romania and quite possibly the rest of us. Do you see that attitude changing? I happen to agree with that 100%. It's called the birth chip. Yeah, I, I think I, I've always been a, a fan of Paul Craig Roberts. I don't always agree with him. Well, of course. He is he's probably one of the, the greatest minds in international affairs writing today. And I think people should pay attention to what he writes because he's really looking not just at the next election, but at the le next generation. Do you agree, though, where he's going with that statement where the egos blinded the eyes is, is what I do you agree with that from what you see living, um, living in the States? Do you do you agree with that? Yes, uh, yes, I do to an extent. Um, for most Americans, most Americans tend to be very parochial about things. Uh, in fact, the majority of Americans have never traveled overseas. So it's only natural that uh, the American citizenry does not fully appreciate the forex or things like the uh, international trade agreements like NAFTA and GATT and the TPP. They're just ignorant of them. And it's not until they cost them personally when they lose their jobs or uh, lose the ability to travel freely, like we lost uh, a few years back with our uh, when passport controls came into effect for travel w between the United States and Mexico and Canada, or when they lose the ability to move currency without penalty, or even in some cases it's considered an out-and-out -out crime to, to move currencies between countries. In the United States, we still have a window of opportunity that people should take advantage of. When, they tra when Americans travel overseas, every member of a family can carry up to $10,000 in cash of whatever currency they want with them without any penalty or any taxation. And for now, you can move assets offshore as long as long as you paid tax on it once. It's your money and you can move it offshore if you'd like. But that window of opportunity may be closing. And Americans need to wake up to that fact. I want to take my final question. I'm watching the clock and I'm respecting your time that you uh, had available for me. Assuming you're still alive, what are you going to say? What are you going to say to the people, the grandchildren, the children that are still alive when they learn that all of this, if it turns nuclear, was all avoidable? What are people going to say? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think that is, if, if you look at things from a multi-generational standpoint, it all comes down to the, vo the, the forces of freedom versus the forces of tyranny. And People need to recognize that tyranny can have many faces and fly many flags. And fascist tyranny is just as dangerous as communist tyranny. And uh, right now, America is slipping under the control of corporate fascism. I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to let our viewers know the easiest way to reach with you. But I'm quoting Mark Passio on something I read a while back, which I think is tremendously important, and that is no one has the right to be ignorant when it affects other people's freedoms. That's a good quote. Jim, it's been an absolute pleasure, a long time, and uh, sometime I want to fill you in about our side of the pond, how things are going. And how do, what's the easiest way to reach out and stay connected with you, Jim? Sure. Um, my website is survivalblog.com. It's all available free. There is no super secret members only area. The archives are fully searchable. They now date back to, uh, what? Gosh. <laughs> 2005, uh, so we've got 11 years of the blog that's fully searchable, fully available, and there's a wealth of information there on family preparedness primarily, but a lot 
um, on a whole range of topics, everything from water filtration and food storage, alternative energy, do-it-yourself medicine, you name it, it's in there. Again, they're all free of charge. I'm not trying to sell anything here. Take advantage of all that information. It's free for the taking. That's survivalblog.com. Jim Rawls, I want to thank you so much for taking a bit of time to talk with me today and uh, scud us out on uh, DR Escapes and our new website, somethingfeelswrong.com. God bless.